In times of need, this is what most insurance sounds like. What's your policy number? But insurance with AAA sounds like this. Is everyone okay? See the difference at AAA.com slash insurance. And... From the Kansas City Sports Update Studios, welcome to Kingdom Radio, where we talk about all things Kansas City Chiefs. Brought to you by Arrowhead Update. Join Chris and Richard on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, Player FM, CastBox, and all third-party applications. Check us out on Facebook platforms such as Kansas City Sports Update and Arrowhead Update. And if you cannot find us there, Google or search Kingdom Radio and Kansas City Chiefs, and you will find us. Welcome to the Kingdom. You're all on it. Uh, you guys can find me on the Stinking Truth podcast as well for all your fans. Uh, I have my own podcast. But, uh, you know, being on a Chiefs podcast is kind of like eating a turd sandwich for me. So, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the – but I'm, I'm okay. Like, I, I – hey, listen, man, I, I like greatness. And uh, and uh, they've been pretty good the last couple of years. So, uh, I have, I've got nothing but – I mean, as much as I hate them, and I hate them um, – I've got nothing but the utmost respect for him. And Andy Reid is, is one of the best men in the NFL, and so I always root for good people to have success. Um, Absolutely. That's, the, oh, that's, that's about the level of niceness that I'm going to come with tonight, okay? So hey, just, hey, just bear with me. I mean, that's, that's about it for me. That's, that, that is as good as it's going to get. Hey, and we really appreciate that. And, I mean, as, as understanding, you know, you're Mark Schlereth. You, you are uh, a Denver, hey, me, Denver let Bronco. You, let me tell you a quick story. Okay. I'll tell you a quick story. So I go to this, I was at the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. So Fox asked me to host uh, Fox asked me to host this kind of chalk talk thing for all their big kind of all their big corporate bigwigs, right? Mm-hmm. And then they said, Hey, we'd like to send you to the cor- the Super Bowl with all these corporate bigwigs. And so I was like, Yeah, you know, so I go to the Super Bowl. Now it's the first one that I went to see where I was in the stands, you know, that I wasn't playing it, right? So it was Correct. pretty. It was pretty interesting, and obviously, I played for Mike Shanahan for six years, so I was rooting hard for the 49ers and Kyle Shanahan Correct. because I've known that kid since he was, a, you know, since he was a teenager for crying out loud. And, right. Uh, he, as a matter of fact, he is the last person ever to hold the cord in the Super Bowl. Super Bowl Thirty Two was the last time that the headsets for the head coaches had cords on them. Gotcha. They were wireless. Super Bowl 33. Right. So Kyle Shanahan has not only coached in several Super Bowls, one as a head coach and one as a coordinator, but he was the last guy to hold the cord for a head coach in a Super Bowl. Wow. So I'm in the stands, and we're right about like on the 45-yard line, about eight rows up. Mm-hmm. And I kid you not, I am surrounded by nothing but Chiefs fans. And I they're all it. like in their 30s. Right, and, right. And, and I, am, I am talking so much to my friend shit. <laughs> um, the whole game with all these thirty-year-olds, right? And we're going back and forth, and back, and I am so I am crushing, you know, because I like to think that I'm a really good loser, but I'm a really bad winner. And <laughs> when the, when the Niners are up by ten with six and a half minutes left, I am giving it like they're kids, they're thirties. I'm giving it to these kids, and I mean I'm just crushing them, right? Oh right. And then yeah. all of a sudden, third and fifteen happens to Tyree Kill, and I'm like, oh shoot, you know, here we go, but. I, I got to tell you, it was one of the coolest experiences, man. We were all hugging after the game. It was a great game. High five and all my Chiefs fans, and I'm like, you guys suck, but I love you. <laughs> and um, it was a, it was one of the coolest experiences. We just had a great time. It was obviously a phenomenal game, and um, and you know to watch the Chiefs win it made me sick. But I really wasn't that I really wasn't that upset. Um, 
it was just a, it was a great game and it was a really cool watch and I had a great experience with a, a bunch of different Chief fans that were all kind of I mean that stadium was done I, I, if I had a like if I had to just take a guesstimate it, I bet you it was it was 70 30 Chief fans over Niner fans I mean it I was it. loaded with Chief it was amazing so I love we it. had a great good time the people were awesome and um, good deal and um, like I said, you know, uh, watching them win was like eating a turd sandwich, but it was, I had a great time, I had a blast. And, you know, that's a little bit uh, says some things about the atmosphere in, the, in Kansas City and the fans. Uh, you know, we're always welcoming yeah. no matter where we are. Even, you know, at the Super Bowl, I love the fact that it was, you know, dominant with, with – uh, red, but it, it was it's an experience that you'll never forget, and I love the fact that you got to experience it with Chiefs fans. Um, but I do want to let's talk about you a little bit. Um, I, I okay. do I do have to ask you, um, what was it like growing up and playing in Alaska? I mean, Anchorage is another animal, and that's a, ho- a whole other climate. And I know that had to uh, be I, I don't know that build the gridiron in you real quick. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it was it was interesting because it was obviously Anchorage is, is small, it's a couple hundred thousand people. You mm-hmm. know, in high school when I was there, big oil town, so it was probably uh, two hundred, two hundred twenty-five thousand people total. Um, I think we had six high schools, but all the high schools were big. My my high school had over three thousand kids in it. Oh wow! Um, and like my grad, my graduating class. I don't know what my graduating class was, but I think the freshman class underneath me was about a thousand kids. I think ours was probably like six to seven hundred something i mean it, and i may be exaggerating but it was it was big i know we had over three thousand but um we we legitimately played six games or seven games so we didn't play a lot of games okay and um i, I mean i loved it I, I i had a blast um in alaska alaska's awesome i wouldn't you know i wouldn't move back there but um uh, absolutely loved growing up there summertime was awesome um you know, it's always funny because I had two scholarships. There's two teams that came up uh, to Alaska to run a football camp. Mm-hmm. And um, and so, you know, I, I mean, I was a gifted, obviously I was a gifted athlete, um, you know, before I had all the injuries and all the crap but and, and got really fat. But I was a gifted <laughs> athlete at that point. And um, the two coaching staffs came up. One was the University of Idaho. One was uh, the University of Hawaii. And both of those schools offered me scholarships. I took recruiting trips to both places. And the truth of the matter is there was two things that made me choose Idaho. Um, one, playing only six games a year when all the kids, you know, we used to call it the lower 48, right, the contiguous 48. Mm-hmm. When you live in Alaska, you call it the lower 48. I got to, I got to the contiguous 48 and called it the lower 48. Nobody knew, like, nobody knew what I was talking about. They're like, what the hell is that? Like, you know, the lower 48. Like, no, we don't know what the lower 48 is. Um but nobody knew, so I, I, I went to Hawaii, and they were in the whack, and, and Idaho at the time was Division One AA. They've moved back there since. Right. Um, but I looked at Idaho. There's two things. I said, I think I can go to Idaho. I think I can play. Like, I think I'll get time to play. And, um, and then um, Hawaii, I wasn't sure. You know, I was like, I don't want to. And a bunch of Pac-10 schools at the time offered me walk-on, preferable walk-on. But I was like, I don't want to sit on the bench for three years. Right. Like, I don't know if I can play there. Right. The other thing I didn't want to do was I didn't want to. I didn't want to wake up the sunshine. Three hundred days a year, you know, three sixty-five a year. Like I, I grew up in Alaska. Like in the summertime, it's fifty-five and drizzly. You know, a sunny day if it's sixty-five and sunny, like nobody's got their clothes on. It's like, oh my god, we're having a heat wave. <laughs> right. And so, you know, I, I really looked at those two factors. Which at eighteen, I thought, you know, looking back on it, it's a fairly mature decision. I was like. You know, hell, I don't, I don't want to do this. I'm gonna turn the light on. Hold on, real quick. Yep, no problem. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, no, not a problem. No, I, that's why I went to the University of Idaho, and um, and you know that's how I got out of Alaska. I, I turned out. You know, there was one guy before me by the name of Rocky Cleaver that played in Alaska, he played at West High School in Alaska, but I think he transferred, I think his family transferred up there in the military. So I was the first guy ever born and raised in the state of Alaska to play in the NFL. And several, like, I think, I think, uh, was it Eugene Tongue that played for you guys? Was Tung, was was that, uh, he was the last kid from... Reggie Tongue? The safety? Reggie Tongue, that's it, Reggie Tongue. Um, there's an offensive lineman, I think, that played for you guys from Alaska as well, maybe. 
Um, but he played up in Fairbanks, like Ileson or something. Maybe maybe it was just Reggie Tung for you guys. Maybe that was it. I think he played for the Niners now that I think about it. But anyhow, it doesn't matter. There's been a few of us. Um, but I think I was the first guy ever born and raised in the state of Alaska to uh, you know to play in, this, in, in the National Football League. By the way, those notes behind me, you see those notes? Um, my wife is out of town, and she leaves post-it notes all over on the on my responsibilities because she knows that I, I'm like she knows that I'm a failure when it comes to actually <laughs> taking care of the house. So everywhere you walk around this house right now, there are post-it notes all over the place. So I don't like I don't burn down the house, or like she just knows that I have no I have no shot. And maintaining this house without her here. Oh, that's good stuff. Hey, and, and you know that's that's re- respect to the the wife and, and the household. Sometimes you need a, a subtle reminder, and and I'll tell you what, I'm bad at it too. So I'm not any different. I, yeah. I, I fall in that category as well. So cheers to the the old ladies who keep yeah. everything running, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, Chris, I want to get you involved here. We're going to get into the, the playoff game because this is what kicked off our conversation here. I kind of sparked a little fire here. And, and Chris, go ahead okay. and let's, let's, let's get into this 98 playoff game. Okay. Oh. Okay, so, uh, Mark, back in 98, um, I believe it was three days um, after the playoff game, it was reported that you and several of, the, of your teammates – were fined for having a foreign yeah. substance on your uniforms. Do you yeah. can, can you clarify sure. what happened sure. with all of that for us? You guys signed Michael Dean Perry, and you only signed Michael Dean Perry to pump him for information. And Michael Dean Perry told your coaching staff that we greased up with Vaseline uh, before every game, which we did. I mean, it, like, here's the deal. When you played in the NFL back in those times, so I always had grease on my arms and grease in my armpits because of the jersey, because it rips. It's so tight, it's so skin tight that it rips your armpits up. And then um, as we we cover our shoulder pads in carpet tape, so it's a two-way carpet tape, Mm -hmm. and we would make these little wings. So let me show you where a defensive lineman holds you. They grab you right here. So right here there's, there's... Right there is it, there's a shoulder pad here, right, and then yes. the back plate is here. Mm-hmm. So right here is a place where that shoulder pad sticks out, and you can actually grab it, and it's something that you can hold on to, right? Right. So we would form these we would form these pla- pieces of plastic. So it's like this this little piece of cardboard, right? Mm-hmm. And we would paste that between the back plate and the shoulder piece, so there's nothing to grab, right? So it was a hard piece of plastic. We molded it in there, and then we tape it into our uniforms. Then we tape the jerseys onto the we tape the jerseys onto the shoulder pads. And yes. then, I mean, Vaseline on the arms, and Vaseline right here where you would under your armpit, and right here where people would try to grab you. And I mean, we did it. I, well, I did it for my whole career. Uh, and that's nothing new. Ever. And defensive linemen would spray their their jerseys right here with silicone. Right. And so it was one of those things, like it's one of those things that everybody everybody in the league did it. And like you know, you're not supposed to use stick them on your gloves. If I put my hands on the grass, they'd come back. It would look like I had sawed on my hands. <laughs> they were so damn sticky. Right. My gloves were so sticky. <laughs> um, but everybody, everybody did it, and it was just kind of one of those unspoken things that nobody bitched about it, right? Right. Nobody whined about it because everybody did. So, so then, Michael what? Dean Perry came in and said, hey, this is what we do. And so your coaches basically told the referees, and so they took us to the sideline, you've seen it, and they wiped our arms off. Yes. And so um, they fined us $5,000, and then Mike Shanahan called the league, and Mike Shanahan was like, it's 10 degrees out. Everybody's got everybody's got Vaseline on their arms, you know, because nobody plays. That's another reason that offensive linemen don't wear sleeves, because you can grab them. Right. So, like, defensive linemen are the holdest sons of bitches that, that have ever, like, I'm holding on every single play, but they hold <laughs> just as bad as we hold. Like, oh, yeah. So there's, this, there's this game within the game, and everybody just understands that that's what's going to go down. And yeah. so, you know, as a, as a football team, we just kind of looked at it like, really, like, you guys are really going to do this. You know, you've got, 
Like, you don't have crap on, like, your old linemen don't have crap on their jerseys and arms as well. And, like, everybody did it. So, mm-hmm. um, anyhow, so anyhow, Mike Shanahan called the league and said, dude, it was 10 degrees. All my guys have grease on their arms. Like, all the, you know, the, the, I mean, everybody. And when it rains, guys do it on their shoes. They, they coat their vac- Vaseline on their shoes. There's so many little things that go on that the average fan just doesn't know that we do to get ready to play a football game. And, um, and so they rescinded all those fines. Nobody got fined. And, um, and everybody just kind of said, okay, yeah, we, we get it. So that's, that's the story behind that. But, yeah, I had uh, – we all have that. I mean, I have Vaseline on my arms and, and underneath my armpits and right back here on the grab point. Like, if you're going to stick your hand back there and try to grab my jersey, you're going to get a handful of Vaseline. Right, um, fair or enough. Or at least you're going to get fingers – your fingers are going to get greasy. And just know that that's going to happen. And, and it's nice that and you know. You know for... that I'm going to hold you on every single play, <laughs> and I'm going to be. I used to tell. I actually used to tell referees as I got older. I, I used to tell referees, "Listen, the kids right now are bigger, faster, stronger, and I'm just older and more broken. And I'm absolutely <laughs> going to undress this guy. Like I am going to absolutely undress him. I, I guarantee you, my hands will be inside. I will drive him like a Cadillac. I'm going to. I'm going to abuse this kid, but my hands will be inside the whole time." And you can't call me for that. There we go. And, and they would laugh, and I'm like, I'm not, like, I'm not shitting you. I'm not kidding around. This is what I'm going to do to this kid, and just understand. Hey, if my hands get outside the shoulder, you know, outside the shoulder pads, outside the, I, hey, throw a flight. I get it. But I'm going to absolutely destroy him, and my hands will be inside the whole time. And they'd be like, all right, stink, you know. And you'd be like, okay. And and I mean, I had that conversation. I can't tell you how many times I had the conversation just about before every game. Um, <laughs> And so that's it. You know, those, those are the things that go on during the course of the game that the average the average person is never privy to. But that's that's the gamesmanship, and that's the stuff that goes on on a consistent basis. So, so I've I've got to ask you. You know, after all of that, given everything that you said, I mean, there had to have been one guy that you know, one player that gave you, you know, a lot of hell and and just gave you grief. What was that one player? Oh, yeah. Well, there were there were several players, and you know the crazy thing is is it's not the players you think. Like I was always extremely successful against Cortez Kennedy. Um, was always very successful. Like I always played Warren Sapp. Well, like the really good players, I was really, you know, I really had, you know, I, I really usually played pretty well. Um, Dan Stanley Mua back in the day, he was an absolute beast. Um, and, and Danny was a great, he was a great player. Um, the guys that really gave me fits um, were guys that were super multiple and almost gelatinous. So, like guys that if I can get my hands on you, you're done. Even though right. you know I, I played at, at two ninety, two eighty eight. Mm-hmm. Um, like I am to this day, I am. A freak show weight room wise. I, right. I, I mean, my dad, my be- dad benched 300 pounds on his 78th birthday. Um, wow, hey, that's a feat in 80, itself. My dad is 80 years old, and my dad can still probably do 10 reps with 225. Oh, so, I have, I have this from a genes, and now my joints suck, and I have a lot of injuries, but I still have, you know, ridiculous, just ridiculous strength, mm-hmm. and. Um, so my thing was, I don't care if you weigh 350. It doesn't bother me. I don't care how much you weigh. If you run into my hands, you're blocked. You're done. Mm-hmm. It's just there's no way. I am so I was just so freaking strong that way. So the issue for me was the guys that never let you touch them. I, like I said, I call them gelatinous. You know, you punch them and they just kind of absorb it. You know. Right. And so there was there's several guys over the course of my career. Um, guy by the name of Pierce Holt, who played for the San Francisco 49ers, and he played for the Atlanta Falcons. And um, I'm playing, I'm a young player, a uh, Pro Bowl player for the, the Redskins, and we scrimmaged the 49ers in, in San Francisco, or excuse me, in London. And um, we have these several scrimmages, I just eat this kid's lunch, right? <laughs> and from that point forward, every time I played him, he would line up literally two and a half yards off the ball. And he'd come charging at me. He was like the Tasmanian devil, you know. Blah! And, you know, I was such an upkick guy, and I wanted to take the fight to the line of scrimmage. And I'd just be 
sitting there going, oh, shit. Um, <laughs> he gave me fits. He, he gave, he, I gave him a couple sacks in a game, in a playoff game uh, against Pierce, man. He was he was an absolute nightmare for me. Uh, Phil Hansen of the Buffalo Bills, a skinny little, like he was a, he was just a nickel player. Like he'd come down, he's a yes. defensive end, a little white guy, defensive end that wasn't, you know, great on the outside, couldn't really turn a corner. But he just had great hands, like a karate dude. Same thing with Dennis Bird. Dennis yes. Bird had like the best hands. And he's like, yeah, you know. And you never felt like you got a shot. Like those guys drove me nuts. I could um, see you could I never get your hands on them. Like, I'd love you to play. Yeah, I'd love you to play the power game with me all day because, like right. I said, um, there's nobody, there's nobody that can drive me into the back. And nobody. Um, but I had trouble with the guys that that had that skill set, you know, that the ability to move and slap your hands and do a bunch of stuff. Those guys, mm-hmm. um, those guys were the harder guys for me to block. I could see that. I could see that. Uh, you know, Mark, I, I want to ask you about this. We're going to get into a little serious note here, and this is just because I respect your opinion on every network that that you're on. Um, you know, I've always um, respected your opinion, and I'd like to know what are your thoughts on the you know the video that several players, including Patrick Mahomes and um, Tyron Matthew. Um, participated in that was re- released to support the right. Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and wh- what do you think that means to the NFL and, you know, players like yourself, you know, to, to have a quarterback who's not scared to voice his yeah. his word and his opinion? I, I think it's I think it's awesome. I think this is an awesome time in our country. As, as hard as it is, and it's incredibly hard, um, you know, I don't know about you guys, but every day uh, when I went to school, we said the Pledge of Allegiance, right? Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America to the Republic, which, which stands one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible liberty and justice, and justice for, for all. all. Yes. Right? Didn't say liberty and justice for some. It said for all. Correct. And I think as an athlete sometimes, um, you know, you get to the point where you guys are so connected. Right. Um. And, you know, you look at your differences, whether it's where you grew up, how you grew up, uh, the color of your skin, the, the stereotypical nature of, of what, you, you know, what you are. And you just embrace each other for all those differences. And you start to realize as you play together. I mean, I lived in a locker room my whole life. And being a part of television for the last 20 years is kind of like being in a locker room. I you could. get to the you get to the kind of understanding that. There's a hell of a lot more that makes us alike than there is that separates us. Very true. And you live in you live in kind of an insulated world, you know, like because you don't have a lot of the problems that the rest of the nation has. And you know, you're so myopic in what you're doing from a day to day basis as far as playing football and trying to be the best you can be and lifting and studying and, and going out and playing all that stuff that oftentimes, you know, for me anyhow, I just don't pay a whole lot of attention to what's going on politically or anything else and I have always um, you know I have always been an incredible hard worker but I've always been um, empathetic and compassionate and have been taught to love um, and taught to care for people um, and that's just the way I'm wired and I've always been wired like that and so um, you know it's it, for me there's, there's part of this that is heartbreaking in that you know I haven't because I have been insulated I haven't been as involved as I probably should be and you know I've always like I said I've always loved people and I've always cared um, for everybody on my football team regardless of you know where they come from and, th- and that's like to me that's one of the cool things about playing football you know one of the, the, the best things that I've ever been a part of was for six years in Denver um, and my offensive line coach, I love him. Uh, Alex Gibbs, he coached in Kansas City as well. Mm-hmm. Um, he's an absolute tyrant. I mean, the guy is just an absolute crazy man. But one thing we did on every Friday was we would shut down the meeting a half hour early, and Alex would walk up to the grease board. We'd all be all, you know, all 14 offensive linemen, all from different walks of life, you know, from different parts of the country and different ethnicity, ethnicities and different, you know, economic backgrounds and all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. and he'd write a topic on the board and and we would sit there and discuss it like 
this, 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 like one time I just, this resonates with me. He goes, okay, stink. Um, your son comes home. Um, he's 14 years old and your son comes home and says, Hey dad, I'm gay. Go. What do you do? You know, and then it became a half an hour discussion with all of us from all these backgrounds. And, you know, in this kind of, this world of machismo of a football player. And, um, and it was one of the coolest things ever because we got to understand and really got to respect everybody's walk of life and everybody's background. And even if you didn't agree with the guy, you respected his opinion and where he came from. And the bottom line is you have to go out and you have to play for one another and you've got to play and you got to be willing to sacrifice for one another. Right. And, you know, I think that's, you know, I think that's the, the coolest thing. One of my favorite scriptures, um, you know, in, in the Bible comes in Philippians, and there's so many that are in Philippians that are great, but the Apostle Paul is writing to the church of, of Philippi, and he's writing from jail, um, mm-hmm. and he says, make my joy complete in chapter 2, uh, Philippians 2, chapter 2, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, the same love, united in spirit, do nothing of selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, treat others as more important than yourself. And yes. to be great, you have to be willing and you have to be able to do that. Yes. And the thing that's really cool about playing in the NFL is, you know, we used to joke around all the time as players, they go, really the only thing that's different between the black guys and the white guys, and, and like this is stereotypical, but I'm going to, like we joked around about it all the time, like th- this is really the only difference. If you go to a white dude's apartment that's single, like it's so freaking cold, you could hang meat in that apartment. <laughs> you go to a black guy's, it's so damn hot that you could fry meat on the on the countertop. And that's a stereotype, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying it. But we joke around like, other than that, we're all the same. Like, there's no yes, real difference. There isn't. And um, and if you start to realize that, and you start to bond together, and you start to love one another, and you start to really like, there's nothing, there's nothing that we can't overcome. So that's one of the reasons I think this is so cool that Patrick Mahomes and all the guys, and Tyron, Matt, Tyron Matthew, and all those guys got involved and really pressured the NFL to basically stepping back and looking at their stance and going, you know what, we got bullied by the political machine. Yes. And, and I'm not going to do that anymore. Yeah, you know, I've had this conversation. I actually had this conversation um, with Roger Goodell. Not that, not that my conversation with him made any difference and not that it had any bearing on his decision, but I, I'm, glad that it, I'm glad that he made the decision that he made. But I had this conversation with Roger, and I said, you know, the thing that pisses me off about the league is – we, we, you know, we bow down on penance knee, and we make policy change based on people who hate our game. We let right. people who hate our game set the narrative, you know, with concussion issues and all, and CTE and all that stuff. And I, I'm like, forget them. Screw them. If they don't like it, I don't care. It's the greatest game in the world. And, and I'm telling you, I had 29 surgeries over the course of my career. Football has given me so much more than it has ever taken. And I said, why we allow, why we allow people to hate our game to set the narrative for the nation about our game is baloney. So forget them. Our game is awesome. It is great. It's the greatest game ever invented. And if there are people that don't like it, tough luck. Because I agree. Guess what? There are people lined up to get season tickets. Absolutely. So we'll just go with them. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that. And, and the... Look, the the movement that is going on uh, in the NFL right now, you know, you said it best, is uh, the the NFL did get bullied, you know, by a political movement. And now the players, you know, the high-profile players finally have a voice and are like, look, this is what it's going to be and this is where we stand. And the NFL really doesn't have a choice but to fall in line with that. And I think that's a, you know, a huge aspect is... Uh, to the future, and you know, Patrick Mahomes. Let's be honest. You know, I, I know that you, you'll never, you know, be a Chiefs fan or truly love Patrick Mahomes, but I know you respect what he represents. Uh, that's a he. That's a huge key to the element of that that movement for the NFL because he is the face of the NFL right now. Oh, there, there's there's no question. I mean, when Patrick Mahomes is on that video, you know, you're like, uh oh. I mean, that dude's a unicorn. Yes. I mean, he, he takes a dump. It's rainbow sherbet. Like that, <laughs> that. Like he could sell that. He could sell that at the ice cream stand. Um, yeah, and so he's got that kind of power, and, and and good for him. You know, I mean, he's 
obviously he's come from a family that understands professional sports. He grew up in a locker room, and he understands the dynamic and the love and the and the connection you have um, for one another. You know, so right. Um, I, I just you know I just think it's I just think it's it's really cool, and I think you know I think that professional sports and sports in general can be really the like the lightning rod, really the catalytic kind of movement um, towards this this country understanding um, our differences are our greatest strengths. Listen, right. man, I, I grew up, I cut my teeth with the Washington Redskins and the Hawks, but the guys that I try to pattern my life after, that some of the strongest men, some of the strongest Christian men, some of the strongest husbands, some of the strongest fathers, and some guys that I try to pattern my life are all black. Right. You know, yes. Daryl Green. It's it's Charles Mann. It's Art Monk. It's Monty Coleman. Those guys are my. Those guys. I mean, those guys. I, I love them. Those guys are my guys. They're and great leaders. I look at those guys as that's that's what I want to be. Right. That's who I aspire to be. Right. You know, I want to be like those guys. And so, um, I don't know. It it just is. It, you know, when you when you grow up in that environment. Um, I just, I just think it's, you know, it's like I said, I've, I've been insulated and I probably haven't done all, I, I not probably, I haven't done all that I could do. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the NASCAR guys said it best. It's not just good enough to not be a racist anymore. Like you got to be right. proactive. Very and, true. um, and I've always been proactive with the way I have, you know, loved people and had empathy for people and, and, um, and, and been kind to people. But, um, but, uh, you know, I think again, it's about, it's about standing up for what's right and, you know, and, and starting to understand, like, I think you walk, you walk out of the locker room and, you know, you're kind of on your own path and you've got your own family and you're doing your own thing. And, you know, you just tune out to society and it's, it's time to tune in and say, okay, wait a minute, where do I see things that need to be rectified and how can I help and how can I be involved? Right. And that's a great outlook. Um, Chris, hop in here. Uh, you know, let's let's hear your thoughts on this because this is a huge topic right now, um, and and I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Or, or you know, we can just talk X's and O's, Chris, and we can talk about the Chiefs <laughs> and what I like about the Chiefs, man. <laughs> we could we could do that too. You know what? You know what I hate, honestly. You know, okay, let me ask you guys this. Yeah, but, because the rest of the AFC West, and you know, and and yeah, let's just face it. Um, we're all piddling down our legs a little bit in the rest of the AFC West, right? Correct. Everybody's piddling down their legs. And everybody is like, everybody's like, okay, we got to match Kansas City's speed. And I just, I shake my head. I like, I just am like, are you kidding me? Like, you know, here in Denver, we drafted two receivers that can really run, you know, and we're they went tight end. They won't block his way out of a wet paper sack, but he can <laughs> run like the wind, you no know. Fun. And, <laughs> and everybody's praising Elway, and, and, you know, Elway goes on a victory tour. And, and meanwhile, I just want to, you know, for me personally, um, you know, it's like somebody pissed in my Cheerios. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> I, watch, I watch the teams that beat the Chiefs. And it's not that they match up speed wise. Like the teams that beat the Chiefs um, will blitz Mahomes up the middle. They'll play press man and they'll disrupt routes in critical situations. Try to get the timing off. Try to pressure Mahomes. Right. And try to possess the ball, whether they possess it through running like the Colts did, or they possess it like the Chargers did by just throwing it a bunch. But they'll possess the ball create first downs and essentially hold on as the Chiefs come charging back to make it a, you know, a 29, you know, a, a, a 29, 30 loss or what, you know, I mean, you know how it is. You watch yeah. them, right? Yeah. They're incredible. So it is. I hear everybody talk about speed and we're going to, we're going to get in a track meet with the Chiefs. And I'm like, you guys are idiots. You don't get in a track meet with the Chiefs because you're going to lose a hundred percent of the time. So very true. Like, I mean, it must it, it's got to feel pretty good to watch everybody piss down their legs a little bit about about how they're going to play. The, I mean, for you guys, right? It's about I mean, time. Let's not get too pride. Let's not get too prideful. You guys ain't won shit in fifty years. Okay? So <laughs> let's not let's not get too excited about it. But, um, but it's got to feel pretty good. 
I would think. It, it does. You know, the last couple of years have been, you know, a great roller coaster of emotions. Chris, oh, I absolutely. know you've been excited. Go ahead, Chris. No, you're good. You know, um, like you kind of alluded to, who the last couple of years have been really uh, up and down, more so on the up recently since uh, Mahomes has taken over the helm. Um, and, but so, Mark, I want to ask you, what what do you think that the Denver Broncos need to do in order to truly be competitive with the Chiefs? I know that you kind of talked about it a little bit there with the physicality component, um, but uh, what direction do you think that the Broncos need to take in order to be more competitive? Well, I mean, obviously, one of the things that sets the Chiefs apart, which nobody talks about and it irritates me, um, is – that the Chiefs consistently, if you watch, you watch the Chiefs play offensively, they're getting five guys out in the pattern 80% of the time. Like, they just, right. they're, they're just like, hey, guys, we're playing 5 0 protection. And what nobody gives them credit for is Fisher and Schwartz are two of the best tackles in football. Absolutely. And all anybody wants to talk about is the speed of Kelsey. Or the speed of Tyreek Hill, the protection or the speed of um, you know Sammy Watkins or Mark Markel, Markel, Markel Holt, Hartman or whatever his name is, right? Um, and and all I see is shit. They got five guys out in the pattern, and this offensive line is holding them. And when it breaks down, obviously Mahomes is you know scrambles around, and which is the worst thing that can happen, right? Right. Um, I, there, there's a couple things. Like one. There are always those guys that you ask me who I struggle against. There's always those guys that, for whatever reason, you don't match up well against, right? Yep. Like the way they the way they play, the way they uh-huh. take a set, even though it doesn't make sense on paper. You look at it on paper, and I always say this about you know the game, if the games were played on paper, I'd spend a lot less time on the operating table. Um, they're not. <laughs> Fair enough. They're played on a field. Makes a lot of sense. And, and so there are certain <laughs> matchups that you get into. That doesn't make no it makes no rhyme or reason. There's certain guys and they're just they're just a bitch, right? They're hard. Yeah. And for whatever reason, Mitchell Schwartz owns Von Miller. For sure, owns him. he does. Yes, he you're right. Owns him. He just owns him. And and so the fact that you don't have to tie guys up in protection and and that Mitchell can block 58 has been it's been huge. For the Chiefs. Yep. I mean, huge. I completely um, agree. And so you don't have to double team them, I and you can get five guys out the pattern. Like, that's – so that's going to have to change. I mean, they're going to have to figure out a way to pressure. Most of the time from – and I've been watching. I, I've got you gone back this – gone back and looked at all of the eight losses the Chiefs have had. I think it's eight losses over the last two years. Mm-hmm. And – uh, two things stand out to me. Um, how much, in critical situations, how much press man the other team plays. Yes. Which, you know, you're going to give up. You're going to give up some big plays, right? Right. But how much press, press man they play and how important oh, um, a constricted pass rush lane. Like, you'll see teams either get pressure up the middle and maintain outside leverage right. where they're just telling those defensive ends don't don't fight, stay up field. Yep. Or they'll pinch the DNs in, you know, they'll run a tackle end game and tell the tell the defensive tackles, you stay up field mm-hmm. and make sure you corral them and push them back in. And then they'll bring one linebacker and play press man behind it, right? Mm-hmm. Because the Chiefs want to get everybody out. Right. And when you watch it, that's, that's a pretty consistent that's a pretty consistent um a theme on the teams that have been able to beat the Chiefs. So that's something that I've, I've noticed a lot looking at that. Not all the time. You know, they'll play some zone line and they'll do that. But in critical situations, you see a lot of that transpire. So um, that's that's one thing that you can do. But, you know, Vic Fangio historically has not been – He one, he's not a real – from a scheme standpoint, he's not a, hey, let's scheme up pressure. He's like, hey, let's find a way to get a one-on-one that's really good. And yes. then he likes, you know, he's historically, he's been more of a, a, a cover two, um, quarter, quarter, half. Uh, he's been more of, of, you know, of a guy that'll play zone back there. Um, 
and those things have those things have not hampered the Chiefs at all. So, exactly. And, and then I think just offensive line wise, the, the Broncos just have to be a lot better. And I think their two tackles are a bit of a, um, you know, a bit of a disaster. So. I think they've improved. Well, I say they've improved up front. They went and got Glasgow, who's a good player, but they've got a, a they've got Cushionberry, who is a, you know a rookie that they're relying on to be. They, they're talking about him being really good, but shoot, I don't know. He's a rookie, you know. I mean, right. It's a hard transition. You know, I I look at the quarterback position too with Drew Locke, and you know he grew up in Kansas City, and you know all throughout his high school career. Right. Um, you know, Andy Reid was the head coach, and then he goes to Mizzou, a place that Andy Reid coached before, you know, he was in the NFL. And it just seems like the Chiefs have more tape on it, on Drew Locke than yeah. any team on the planet. Um, and you know, I just, I have to bring that aspect up just because I feel like that's a key piece to, you know, Denver's uh, lack of success against Kansas City or I, you know, I'm sure the things have changed with the progression of Locke in the NFL, but that has to has have a huge play in what's going on with, you know, Denver right now. Right. Well, I I think you know you look at Drew Locke, and all the intangible stuff to me has been great. Mm-hmm. Like his third downs, his is you know maintaining the ball, scramble around, keeping his eyes downfield, making throws. He's done all that stuff exceptionally well, and so. Like, that stuff excites me about Drew Locke. Right. One of the things that's been interesting, you know, is, is you know, I mean, everybody sits here and says, well, like, Garrett Bowles played really well the last four or five games of the season when Drew Locke was in, and so they've fixed the left tackle position, you know, and uh, he only had one holding call or some crap like that. He's only leads the league in holdings every year, you know. <laughs> and they say, you know, Drew, or Drew, or Drew Locke did this, that, and the other, and you know, when I break down film, I look at it like, hey, listen, 60% of the time they were in a heavy, you know, condensed formation, heavy personnel. So they had two tights, they had two backs, they had two backs in a tight end, they had two backs, two tight ends. You know, they were in 12 or they were in 13 or they were in 21 or they were in 22 personnel, right? Mm-hmm. So what that does to you as an offense, you condense to throw the ball, right? And right. it protects both edges. Right. But what it does to you as a defense is you're forced to play a single high safety look. Mm-hmm. So if you're playing a single high safety look, you can play two coverages out of that. You can play cover one, man free, or you can play cover three. Right? Right, okay. So, three deep zone. So, if you run vertical routes on the outside the to cover three, those corners have to match up. Right. Right. They're on the island. It's a matchup principle, right? Yes. So you, you're running. You're running. You know, you're running a, a you're, that matchup zone becomes man. Mm-hmm. So the underneath covers are different, but the bottom line on the outside, cover one and cover three. If you run vertical routes, releases there, it's the same exact coverage, right? Yes. So for your quarterback last year, you broke the huddle in passing situations. You didn't even have to look at the defense. You knew you were going to get rotation. Even if they showed you too high, if the linebackers are, you know, moved over weak or moved over strong, you know what safety's coming down. You know you're getting an eight-man front. All right, in, I see. In those yes. formations out of those personnel groupings. Right. So you you took all that you took all that pressure off that young quarterback. Now they have a new offense coordinator that wants to run everything out of three wides. He's he's historically been in three wide 76 percent of the time you're going to get combo coverages you're going to get you're going to get a lot of different coverages you're going to get a lot of different blitz schemes and the thing that people don't tend to realize is when you spread like kansas city spreads yes you know what else you spread you spread your own line right and you put them in one-on-one positions yes kansas city can hold up i, I promise you denver can right Yes, and so that's that's frightening for me. Like I, I look at that, like that's not a that's not a good decision. The fact that you didn't address the edges of your deep or your offensive line is is scary to me. I, I hope I'm wrong, um, but I never am. I, I'm always usually right. I mean, you know, and I don't like to brag, but I'm, that's going to be know, a I'm nightmare. I said, have Frank Clark coming around <laughs> the corner right there. It's going to be a nightmare for Denver. 
Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I agree. It's going to be scary. Chris, what do you think? I mean, it's going to be scary, but it's one of those things that hey, this is this is football and we're moving in a different direction here and it's fun to watch and it's watch fun to watch the West get fast. It's incredible to see the talent that's uh, come in lately. Hey, and I'll tell you what. What was this... that? I'm sorry, I missed you. Oh, sorry. No, it's, it's been incredible to watch the talent that's come into the AFC West lately. Uh, from the Broncos, from the Raiders, from the Chargers, and then yeah. the, the Chiefs as well. It, it's been great to see the, the division return to the dominance that, that they've had for so long. Um, you know, and well, Yeah, it has been. I... Yeah, I think one one of the other things that drives me crazy about the Chiefs is they have no desire to run the ball. They just, and it irritates the crap out of me. Like they they'll run it ten times a game. They don't, they'll get an eight yards of carry and they get twelve carries. They just like it's so anti what I grew up in with the Redskins and with the Broncos, you know. Oh yeah. And it and it drives me nuts. And you know, they're basically they basically like. There are teams, a lot of teams, that'll play them straight nickel and just say, "Hey, we'll we'll give you seven yards of carry, six yards of carry. Yes. We know you don't want to take it. Right? right? We know you want to throw it. Right? And and like one of my keys, one of my keys, and I'll talk about it on my radio show tomorrow in Denver. One of my keys is just to say, "Hey, match up in nickel the whole game, and let them cram it down your throat. Yeah. Because they'll get impatient. They don't want to do it. Right? Um, anyhow." Nobody, you know, I mean, they just don't. They don't care. And they're so talented. And I, I, I will say this for Andy Reid. He's a great designer of plays and a great play caller. Um, I've always thought he's one of the best innovators when it comes to the screen game and, and, you know, all the jet motion crap and all that all that stuff. He does a phenomenal job. He's a hell of a football coach and a hell of a person. And so um, – I hope he loses every game. <laughs> hey, look, with, the, with that being said, Mark, we've appreciated having you on. It has been a pleasure. You've ran longer than we were scheduled for, and I really, really appreciate that. But I, I've got to give you a chance to promote some of your platforms here real quick before you get off of here. Um, so go ahead and take off on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously you can uh... – there's a couple things. I started a. I'm the worst. Like I buy high and sell low. I started a referral network uh, right here. It's called Marks All Pros. Mm-hmm. Um, right, like about two weeks before we shut down the country with COVID. So um, that's that's really slow rolling right now. But uh, MarksAllPros.com. You want to check out that? I still have the Green Chili Company, and uh, we're crushing it. So if you're stuck at home and you want great green chili or a great queso dip, uh, stickinggood.com is a great place to go. And then please, you know, listen to uh, my NFL podcast. I do an NFL podcast uh, usually twice a week during the season, once a week during the off season. But it's called the Stinking Truth Podcast. You can get it anywhere podcasts uh, drop. I had Paul Calvert on last week. He was great. Uh, but it's just me and my radio partner, and we just chop it up and have a good time. So, uh the stinking truth, uh, if you want to find that. So appreciate you guys. Hey. I'm gonna read my post-it notes to make sure I didn't <laughs> I didn't forget anything, and then I'm going to bed because unlike you clowns, I get up at four o'clock in the morning every morning. You guys probably you probably sleep in to like seven like that. If I, I could like if I slept into seven, I wouldn't know what to do. I would just it'd be like my my life would be over. <laughs> hey. I'd ruin my whole day. Hey. Surprising enough, I, I, I get up early myself. I, I'm an early riser, and you know, you got to make the money. The money's got to be made, and, and somebody's yeah. got to do it. So, um, Mark, I really appreciate that, and I know Chris, you love some some green chilies. So Chris will be all over that website for sure. Um, and hey, we look forward to, to watching it on TV and checking it out on ESPN and all those platforms that you you're rolling on. So, hey, we really appreciate you having or coming on, Mark. You have a wonderful night. Uh, my pleasure, guys, and hopefully I get um, hopefully I get a call at Kansas City game. That'd be fun, man. Hey. Uh, you know, I'm uh, call Kansas City Fox NFL on Fox. Call Kansas City game. It'd be great this year. So hey, I love I'd love to uh, connect with some of the coaches out there. So let's get you to Arrowhead. You guys. By the way, my daughter was on a dating show with uh, Travis Kelsey, my <laughs> youngest daughter. Hey, Chris Kelsey brought that Kelsey. up. Yes, Chris brought that up, yeah. and we were going to mention that. How did that go? I didn't. I didn't invent. I did an event with him a couple of years ago, right after that show at the Super Bowl. That I uh, I 
moderated an event. I busted his balls the whole time. It was awesome. It was just <laughs> awesome. I called him Travis Clara. <laughs> <laughs> And he's a great sport. I know he enjoyed that. He didn't pick my daughter because then he would have had to change his name, you know, in front of the whole crowd. Travis Clara. Anyhow, hey, you guys have a great one, man. All the best to you. Hey, you too. We appreciate your time. And take care, brother. Yep. All right. Take care. Have fun. Yep. All right. Later on. All right. Hey, that was Mark Slareth here on KC Kingdom Radio. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, we're going to let you get out of here. Uh, that interview spoke for itself, and we're excited to have him. Uh, we just hope that you enjoyed it, too. Um, you all have a wonderful evening, Kansas City. Um, we will talk with you soon. Thank you for tuning in to Kingdom Radio, your go-to podcast for everything Kansas City Chiefs. Hey, Cincinnati, Duncan is here to get you ready to start running again with $2 medium iced coffee for DD Perks members. Pair your iced coffee with a sweet black pepper bacon sandwich to keep you running all day long. So, DD Perks members, come get your $2 medium iced coffee today. Not a DD Perks member, but still really want $2 iced coffee? Join on the Duncan app today for an easy, contactless way to order and pay. Pick up in store or at the drive thru. America runs on Duncan. Participation may vary, limited time offer, exclusions apply. En JCPenney sabemos que nos extrañas y nosotros te extrañamos aún más. ¿Pero qué pasa si te decimos que tenemos una tienda abierta todo el día, todos los días? ¡La tenemos! En jcp.com o en el app de JCPenney. ¿Quieres un traje de baño? ¡Lo tenemos! ¿Algo para estrenar este verano? ¡También! ¿Marcas exclusivas y tus marcas nacionales favoritas? ¡También! Visita nuestra página para los más recientes cupones y aprovecha envío estándar gratis en compras de $49 o más. JCPenney. Aplican exclusiones. Detalles en la tienda o jcp.com.